The following video is sponsored by Dashlane. August 15th, 1984. Night falls on Lake Manown, a serene, quiet body of water in Cameroon, Africa. Along its shores lies a sleepy road where that night, a truck crammed with 12 passengers would follow its twists and turns. As the vehicle passed through a dark wooded area, a dense fog began to emerge from the lake, rolling along the ground and covering the surrounding area like a blanket. It engulfed the road in an instant, but as far as the driver was concerned, a foggy night by the water was nothing too out of the ordinary, as he continued en route to their final destination, a destination that would never be reached. Moments following the emergence of this heavy fog, the engine within the vehicle began to sputter, before shutting down completely and slowing the crippled vehicle to a stop. The driver twists the ignition over and over again, but nothing. The engine was completely unresponsive. Sitting on the roof of the parked truck were two of the 12 passengers, who watched as one by one, those inside of the vehicle crawled out to investigate the breakdown. They watched as the group of 10 walked towards the truck's hood, and they watched as one by one, they began to collapse, falling to the ground without a single word. In just a moment's time, the entire group of 10 had perished. As the passengers on the roof looked on in horror, they began to witness the cattle and other livestock shriek in agony before falling to the ground as well. Even the bugs dropped from the sky, as on a night where you would typically hear the sound of a million insects, it instead grew deathly silent. That day, 37 people in total would lose their lives, with hundreds of livestock suffering the same mysterious fate. It was a disaster that happened in an instant, but to most of the outside world, it didn't happen at all. Left baffled, Cameroon authorities had no explanation to this sudden loss of life, leading to the event almost immediately being covered up and blocked out from the rest of the world. And honestly, it may have remained that way forever, had it not been for another event that transpired in an identical manner, with this incident proving to be one of the most shocking in human history. Before we dive into this story, I want to briefly thank today's sponsor, Dashlane. As someone who uses the internet for practically everything, I'm always looking for new ways to streamline my workflow. And given the work I do, I've also been trying to further protect my private information while working online. And Dashlane does both. It's a service that stores all of my passwords, payments, as well as my personal information in a secure place only accessible to me. And when it comes time to use this information, I can access it from all of my devices and log in everywhere with just a single click. Dashlane is consistently ranked as a top password manager in large part due to its patented security technology and machine learning. And on top of it all, Dashlane also comes with a VPN, further making your online presence safer than ever. And with their autofill feature, I never have to worry about memorizing or writing down complex hack-proof passwords. So if you find this as helpful as I do, you can try Dashlane for free on your first device by heading over to dashlane.com nick. And if you'd like to upgrade to premium afterwards, you can do so by using my code Nick for 50% off. Scientists were at a loss following the disaster at Lake Manown, as first-hand reports were few and far between, given that hardly anyone in the area had survived. From what they could gather, residents reported hearing a loud noise at some point during the night. The noise had come from the direction of the lake and sounded almost like an explosion, which seemed consistent with the appearance of the vegetation surrounding the water, as trees, grass, and bushes were left completely flattened, almost as if it had been crushed by the force of an explosion. 
Following the strange noises, fog began to quickly cover the entire area, which was of particular interest, as survivors reported that it appeared different than your typical mist. It had a heavy stench, and even slightly burned the skin of those who stood in its way. And as soon as the fog rolled in, both humans and animals alike began collapsing, and eventually passing away, with the official cause of death for all of the victims being asphyxiation. The fog also seemed to move in an unnatural way, as it rolled along the ground, never straying more than a few feet above the surface, meaning that when the two passengers were seated on top of the truck, they never actually came into physical contact with the mist, because it never rose that high. And given that they had survived unscathed, well, it seemed apparent that the mist itself was likely what had caused the deaths. But determining how or why a mist could have killed everything in the surrounding area, well, that was another question entirely. Looking at all the evidence, it was initially theorized that this event was spurred on by volcanic activity, as there was an active volcano field beneath the lake itself which, upon eruption, may have released a cloud of toxic fumes into the air. Though, upon further testing, it was determined that the volcano was inactive at the time, and no evidence of an eruption was present. This left researchers at a complete loss. If this was not some kind of natural occurrence, then it seemed highly likely that it was, instead, man-made, and potentially a case of terrorism. As given the sound of an explosion and toxins in the air, it was possible that a chemical weapon was used on the region. But this theory was a hard sell too, as the region was so remote and obscure that one would wonder why anyone would target it, let alone target it with chemical weapons. Given this, scientists couldn't settle on a definite conclusion, and with the team at a crossroads, authorities would conclude their investigation and instead focus their efforts on keeping the incident under wraps, erasing it from history in the hopes that nothing like it would ever happen again. But unfortunately, almost exactly two years later, the fog would emerge once more. It happened about 100 kilometers away from Manown, on a body of water called Lake Nios. Night had fallen on the evening of August 21st, 1986, when a loud noise was heard coming from the water. Quickly, the lake began to bubble, almost as if it had turned to a boil. Those bubbles then began to pop, leading to a thick mist emerging from the lake, and almost instantly covering the area in a dense fog. Dramatic as the event seemed, virtually no one was aware of what was happening, as the vast majority of nearby villagers were fast asleep, completely unaware of the danger that they were in. By the edge of the lake, a lady named Halima Sully was living with four of her daughters, and following the sound of the loud rumble, Halima would be awakened in a state of confusion. The sound was startling, but it would prove to be far from the most frightening thing that she would hear that night as immediately after being jarred from her sleep, she began to hear a collage of voices echoing from the village around her. It took a moment to decipher what exactly it was until eventually it hit her. Those sounds were the wailing and the moaning of people emanating from all directions. It was the sound of suffering. As she stood in horror, she would suddenly go completely limp, falling to the floor of her home before passing out. Meanwhile, in a house high atop a cliff overlooking the region, a man named Ephraim Chi would watch the mist roll in and absorb the houses beneath him. In the village below was essentially his entire family, although he didn't think much of the smoke-like mist, as much like Lake Manown, fog by the water was fairly typical. That night, Chi was feeling particularly ill, and after watching the mist for a while, he decided to go get some sleep. When he awoke the next morning, he was completely unaware that his life had just been changed forever. As Chi started his day by heading down towards the lake, he noticed a peculiar silence in the air. Everything around him was perfectly calm, perfectly still, until he heard a voice, the voice of Halima Sully. Chi could hear her shouting in the distance, come here, why are these people lying here? Why won't they move again? He couldn't bear the sight, it was far too horrific, as on the ground in front of Halima lay all four of her children, none of whom were alive. And they weren't the only ones, as all around them, bodies littered the ground of the village. 
As Halima searched the area for survivors, she would discover 31 other members of her family, dead within their nearby homes. In the fields around them also lay the family's cattle, of which they had worked years to obtain. Yet, in a matter of one night, all 400 of them had passed as well. That night, Halima had quite literally lost everything, and all that remained of her family was her. And she wasn't the only one. One man living in the nearby village of Sabum had also heard the loud rumble that night. His name was Joseph Nequain, and after he too was awakened by the blast, he emerged from his bed to check on his daughter. Within his home was a cloud of mist, and through strained eyes, he headed towards her room, though he didn't make it far. He described his account by saying, I could not speak. I became unconscious. I could not open my mouth because then I smelled something terrible. I heard my daughter snoring in a terrible way, very abnormal. When crossing to my daughter's bed, I collapsed and fell. I was there till 9 o'clock in the morning. I was surprised to see that my trousers were red and had stains like honey. I opened the door. I wanted to speak. My breath would not come out. My daughter was already dead. Facing the reality of his deceased daughter, Joseph would try and compose himself as he left his home in search of help, though outside was an even grislier sight. In virtually all the homes that surrounded him were the deceased bodies of his neighbors, some of whom were sprawled across the ground of the village, while others he could see through the windows of their homes, looking as if they had passed away in their sleep. On their skin, and Joseph's as well, were wounds comparable to chemical burns. Surrounding Joseph was nothing but death, as overnight practically the entire village had been wiped out, except for him. And worst of all, he had no idea how or why. In fact, nobody did. But perhaps Joseph's strangest encounter came from the lake itself. As he looked out to the water, he would notice that the lake's signature shade of brown was no more. And instead, that morning, the water ran red. For medical personnel, the sight was shocking. In the villages that the mist reached, survivors like Joseph, Chi, and Halima were few and far between, with those who did remain being left incredibly ill with sores across their bodies. Some had even become paralyzed, losing their ability to move for days and weeks. At Manaon, the medical professionals had found 37 individuals deceased along the water, which accounted for about half of the lake's inhabitants. But things at Nios were instantly much different. As the population was far more dense, and rather than medics finding a few dozen bodies the next day, they instead found hundreds. When it was all said and done, as many as 1,800 people lost their lives that night, with an exact number being unknown, as there were simply too many bodies to count as they moved to quickly bury the dead in a mass grave. Along with this, over 3,000 domesticated animals and livestock were killed as well, with the cause of death for both humans and animals being asphyxiation and no immediate explanation as to why. In the days following the sudden, unexplained disaster, surviving villagers began speculating that what had happened was some type of punishment passed down from an unruly spirit, referring to the fog as some type of supernatural killer mist. But opinions across the region varied, with some calling into question whether the government had been doing some type of experimentation in the area, potentially testing weapons or chemicals before something went very wrong. With this theory in particular remaining a big talking point for a while, as the two lakes affected were so close, so obscure, and both located in Cameroon, it might also explain why authorities had moved to cover up the Lake Manown incident. But as for the authorities themselves, they were concerned that this was yet another act of terrorism, as it was almost as if a bomb had been dropped over top of the lake. After all, the sound of an explosion was undisputed, causing many to believe that the region was under attack. Which, in a way, was somewhat true. Only this attack wasn't from some outside force, and instead, it was from nature itself. As scientists studied the two lakes at the center of these disasters, they would quickly note that both bodies of water were located on top of the same volcanic field. This volcanic field had been producing a large amount of magma, which in turn created carbon dioxide, or CO2, at an alarming rate. 
This was noteworthy as a huge amount of CO2 had been detected in the water of both lakes following these disasters, which led to the realization that over many years, that CO2 had been building up at the very bottom of these deep, deep lakes. And given the region's consistent temperatures, that CO2 had essentially stayed put, growing and growing each day without any sort of release from the depths of these waters. Well, that would be until the nights of August 15th, 1984, and August 21st, 1986, when the Earth had shifted, leading to the sudden exodus of centuries worth of gas buildup. It's unknown for sure what had caused both disturbances, with some theorizing that it could have been something as minor as a small rock slide nearby, or even a cold bout of rain. But whatever its cause, ultimately that carbon dioxide would be released and shoot up out of the water in an instant, soaring over 300 feet in the air. The blast was so severe that it even created a tsunami within the lake, with scientists estimating the wave to be over 60 feet tall, before crashing into the shore, flattening all vegetation in the immediate area, and dying out before it reached any villages. Though it wouldn't be the wave that proved to be so deadly, as instead, it was the mist it brought up with it, as that fog was made up of almost entirely carbon dioxide, as well as other chemicals brought up from the bottom of the lake. CO2 is unbreathable and far denser than regular air, so as it emerged from both lakes, it stayed very low to the ground and essentially replaced all the oxygen in the area with an unbreathable gas, and the more those villagers tried to breathe it in, the faster it made them suffocate. This is why the truck's engine had stopped at the very beginning, as there was no oxygen to circulate within the engine, rendering combustion within it impossible. And this also explains how the majority of survivors lived in higher elevations, just high enough to avoid the low-lying gas. This theory also accounted for the wounds found on the bodies, as they were likely caused by CO2 poisoning. And the lake's red color the following day well, that change was a direct result of the high level of CO2 in the water. The event sounds so supernatural, so unbelievable, but this theory explained everything and would eventually be universally agreed upon as the cause for both disasters. And ultimately, it would lead to the founding of a new type of natural disaster, which would come to be known as a limnic eruption. With this discovery, scientists have now been able to install pipes in the water that allow these lakes to release their CO2 without any large explosions, making Manaun and Nios seemingly safe from another limnic eruption, at least for now. And fortunately, eruptions like this require a confluence of incredibly precise geological conditions, with scientists only confirming three lakes across the entire world that are capable of experiencing such a disaster. Which means that not only are Lake Manaun and Lake Nyos now safe from these eruptions, but the world as a whole is as well. Well, not exactly. The problem arises with that third lake, Lake Kivu, a location where, unlike Nyos and Manaun, there is yet to be any real progress in degassing it. They've added pipes like the others, but they haven't been nearly as effective for one simple reason, size. Lake Manaun and Lake Nyos are small lakes, with Lake Nyos being only about a mile long each way, but Lake Kivu is much, much bigger. And to be exact, in comparison to Lake Nyos, Kivu is 2,000 times larger and has roughly 2 million inhabitants living on or around its shores all of whom could find themselves in the midst of a toxic fog should one of these eruptions occur. And as of now, it seems like only a matter of time. Scientists have discovered that limnic eruptions have been happening at Lake Kivu for a long time, and they seem to happen roughly once every thousand years, meaning that it could happen at any moment, especially considering that the last confirmed large-scale eruption seems to have been roughly 5,000 years ago, meaning that the people living around Lake Kivu may be living on borrowed time, with experts predicting that the event could be even worse than you'd expect, because deep within the lake lies a high level of methane, which, given its flammability, wouldn't just lead to a toxic fog covering the area, but it would lead to fire covering it as well, giving it the possibility of setting miles and miles of land on fire in an instant. 
The risk is so serious that some have fled the area over fears of an eruption, while others go about their daily lives with no clue of the danger that surrounds them, as all it would take is one earthquake or an eruption of a nearby volcano, or even something as minor as a cold bout of rain, to trigger what could easily become the most devastating natural disaster of all time. And with this possibility lurking at any moment, all we can really do at this point is wait. I want to give a massive thank you to the commenter who suggested this video, as well as my gold tier and god tier patrons, Ali Farmer, Barry Winstanley, Bazoo42, Biznacker, Brandon Flores, Karen S, Donovan Aaron, Emily Gray, Game Gamer, Jay Money, Just Alley, Catherine Ross, Lacey, Mark PH, Nathan Backus, Non Luke Music, Quinn Kiwi, Robert Urbito, Sam Lutfi, Skelly, Sub to Micro O, The Deck of Cards, Unblended Korchnoi, and Zinsu Sensei.